Amen, amen, and amen. Now, some of you might be wondering what that mirror is there for, and um, you'll find out in a few moments. We'll definitely have to move it back up on the podium there, uh, the stand in a little bit. I don't want it shining in everybody's eyes, but nonetheless. Uh, I want to continue on with some thought process. I know my time is limited this morning. Um, it was very important that we minister this morning. Amen. Things got changed up a little bit, and that's okay. Sometimes that's what needs to be done, amen, because God wants to minister into the hearts and lives of his children. So just hang in there with me this morning, and I, I'll do my very best to get done right as close to 12 as I possibly can, amen. I don't know how close that'll be, but nonetheless, I'll try my best, amen. We've been talking about the reality over the last, well, actually the first time was a couple of weeks ago in between the missions, about doing something about taking root or take root within our hearts and lives. And we've been taking a look at the, the word take uh, in the process of things and tying it into the reality of what we've been talking about out of Isaiah 37 and 31 since the very last week of last year about the theme of this entire year, which is the, that the remnant, that's you and me, that we shall take root downward and bear fruit upward in our lives. In other words, that you and I will go through the process in life that God commands us to and wants us to and desires us to walk in, not because he's a hard taskmaster, but because God wants to bless us in so many different ways. And so we started talking the other week about, about using the word take as an acronym for what happens within our hearts and lives or the benefits, if you will, that God gives to you and me when we do make the choice to take root. And let me say this, this is a choice. It's something that you and I have got the desire to do. We need to want to do that and see the, not just the benefit of it and do it for the benefit, but recognize that God wants us to do, take root. And in the midst of doing that, we receive out of his bounty the blessings that God can only give to each and every one of us. Because it's a very important thing about taking root. And let me just, just drop this into the thought process. That if I was to take today two plants identical, coming out of the same nursery, and plant them side by side in the ground, water them equally, fertilize them equally, take care of them, you know what I mean, perfectly in, in every manner, shape, and form, the two of them would start to take root and they would start to grow equally. And you literally see these two plants start to grow in equal measure out of that framework because that's the way they're designed to grow. All plants are. But if I was down the road to take one of those plants, even though they're identical, and move it two miles away from the other plant in a little bit of a different soil, and water it not as often as I would the other one, here's what you'd start to see. One would start to grow more than the other. It's a natural process in life. And if I was to take it a little bit further, a couple of weeks later, take and move it again, not giving it the opportunity to take the root that it needs to take, Eventually what would happen is that plant, it would, it would stunt its growth and it would not fulfill the reality of what it's called to do. And so the same thing applies to you and me within how God wants to minister into our hearts and lives and the things that he desires for us to do. God knows that if you don't take root downward, you'll never bear fruit upward. And if you don't bear fruit upward, I'm mindful of the scriptures when Jesus was giving a parable concerning the husbandman and how he took care of the, 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 the vineyard that he had was in charge of, that because of circumstances, there was one tree in particular that didn't grow, and, and he said to the, the one that was nursing and taking care of the plants, he says, okay, listen, he, he, he wanted to cut it down, but the man said, no, give it another season. Let me, let me till around it a little bit. Let me fertilize it some more. Let me trim back the branches. Let me do what it needs to. And if if it doesn't grow then, take and cast it out. And so there's a, a premise there that you and I need to understand about taking root. That's very important for your personal relationship with God. It's important that you determine that you take root downward within that relationship. In other words, let God transform it so that you can start to bear fruit in your life because that's what you were created to do. Amen? Amen. 
And so we all were. So we've been talking about that, about taking root produces good fruit, not only good fruit, but it produces God fruit. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to produce his kind of fruit inside of you so that you will be that reflection of him that you and I both are called to be in life itself. Because if we're not, if we, if we don't allow God to do that, we will never fulfill the fullness of what he's called us to. And that's an important thing that you recognize that today and let God start to do it inside of your heart and your life. So this morning, that's what I want to talk to you about, the reality of going on in the thought process. Because in First Colossians, in Colossians 1.16, the scripture, we talked about this the other week, it says that all things were created by him and all, everything was created for God. You need to realize something about you in particular today that's so important to God that you need to grasp a hold of and allow God to turn around uh, the circumstances in your life. Listen, you arrived into this life, into your life, into this world as an, and as an object of God's divine affection. God loves you beyond your understanding. You were created to be pleasing to God, and you were created to bring glory to God's name. You literally are precious to God. That's an absolute truth of life. If that was not true, Jesus would not have gone to the cross and died just for you. If you're the only person on the face of this earth, Jesus would have gone and died directly for you and you alone. You're precious to him. And housed, housed, if you will, in the very depths of your soul is an innate de driving desire to be able to have, be a reflection of God's glory. That's why he created you and that's what he wants to do inside of you. So when he starts to plant things down inside of us, causing us to grow, that's what he's trying to really do. Cause you and I to literally become the reflection of his glory. You were made to glorify God, and you need to understand that about yourself. And when you do, and you start to realize that God wants to manifest it with inside of you and through us, it causes you and I to realize the need to start to take root and allow God to do what he needs to do inside of us. In Luke 6, 38, we started talking the other week about a reality of when you and I get to that place. That we realize that we need to start to take root and we say, God, this is what I want you to do. And we realize that really it's a benefit that God wants to pour in our life. And we started talking about Luke 6, 38 the other week. And it's important you understand the relative uh, reality of that in your life life and what it is that God wants to do. He says, give and it shall be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, uh, and put, will then put into your bosom, for with the same measure that you use it, it will be measured back to you. The essence of life boils down to this, that God's relationship with you is a give and take relationship. It's one that's based on him, real, you realizing how God wants you to give, and then in the midst of your giving, God literally gives back to you and I. You can see the reality of it, if you will, in, in, in something. If somebody would take one of you guys, would you take one of the, one of you guys take this mirror and stick it up on the, that podium there for me, right there on the midst of it? No, don't fall, don't look at, you, don't, don't, don't look at yourself. I don't want you to break it. I don't, want, I don't want you to think too highly of yourself, more than you should, but in the midst of it. Now look into it, Alec. How do, how do you look? Look in, go ahead, you're good, you're good. How do, go ahead, look in, how you, go ahead, look in, good. No. Alec. Now what I need is I need a volunteer to help me illustrate the reality of what I want to convey to you. I'll pick you, I'll pick you both. Come on, stand up, go ahead. Now don't push each other out of the way, okay? And don't, don't, you only can look at yourselves for only about three seconds, okay? Can you see yourselves in there? Oh, cheap. Oh. <laughs> all right. You, you all can see yourself? Okay. All right. Now, here's, here's what I want to do. I want you to recognize the reality of what we're talking about when it comes to the simple truth about giving and how God wants you to see it today. Because really what we're talking about when we're talking about the simple truth of the factor of taking root in our hearts and lives really boils down to this. That we're talking about God's law of reciprocity. Because when you give to God, wants, God wants to give back to you. That's what reciprocity is. And really we're talking about God's law of reflection. Of what you see. And it's important that you see that, okay? Now listen, here's what I want the two of you girls to do. I want you to smile into there. What do you see when you smiled into there? What did you see? Okay, you saw yourself smiling, okay? Now I want you to get angry. Really get angry. Come on, oh, come on you know better than that. Think about you getting angry at your boyfriend, or you getting angry at your mom, or you getting angry at somebody. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, okay. All right. So you had that going on. Now listen, I want you to literally open up your hand, 
And I want you to stretch it towards the mirror as like you're giving it a gift. No, don't get close. Just stand there. You, you, okay, you're reaching. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. Now, then I want you to do one other thing. He says, I want you to take your hand. I want you to stretch it out towards the mirror. Then I want you to close your hand. And I want you to pull your hand back. Okay, you saw, you saw what you did there, right? Do you have any idea what just happened? Does anybody have any idea what just happened? Something phenomenal just took place that you need to recognize about Luke 6.38. See, when, when these young ladies smiled at the mirror, two young ladies in the mirror smiled back at them. Okay. When they got angry, the person that they were looking at got angry back at them. When they stretched out their hands to, to give to it a gift, the mirror gave the gift back. Did you notice that when you were stretching out your hand giving it? It was given back to you, wasn't it? Yeah. Now when you turned around and you closed your hand and you pulled back, it did the very same thing to you. Did the very same thing to you. All right. See, it's the law of Luke 638, which is the law of reflection, or the law of reciprocity. And it's a principle of God's that today we need to grasp a hold of when it comes to the reality of how God wants you to take root in your life. You can sit down now. Quit looking at yourselves. Alec, go ahead and set that, Alec, set that down on the floor right over there, off to the side. I turn it around off to the side because I don't want anybody shining in it. But here's the reality of what Luke 6.38 plays in your heart and your life on an ongoing basis. Yeah, let, so I can make sure I can look at myself, okay? Whew, pretty bad, I'm telling you. See, as you do, so it will be done to you. Hello? If you bless others... You will be blessed. Amen? If you withhold blessings, your blessings will be withheld. Hello? If you live by taking, in the end, things will be taken from you. If you live your life giving, in the end, it will be given to you. If you condemn others, you'll be condemned. If you forgive others, you will be forgiven. If you live your life with a closed hand, holding on, God's hand will be closed to you. If you live your life with an open hand, a giving hand, His hand will give to you. Because you see, here's the reality. God knows what you have. Now, the reason God knows what you have is because many people don't understand this about what you have. What you have actually is His. And He's given it to you. Now, He's given it to you not to hold on to it, but He's given it to you to be a reflection of Him so that He can use to give to others. Are you hearing me this morning? And you see, that's sort of the reality. Oh yeah, go ahead, you can praise him. That's sort of the reality about what God has called you and I to producing God fruit, if you will, within our hearts and lives. And it's not, sometimes it's about money. But see, if God cannot, cannot control his money in you and through you, he can't control anything else. If, if, you, if, if what he has blessed you with, in other words, and he wants you to you know, hold on, he gives you 90% of it, he says, only, I only want you to give me back 10% of it. If, you can't, if he can't trust you with that, what can he trust you with? People go through life saying, God, I want you to do this and I want you to do that. And yet God sits there and goes, well, mm, I, how can I trust you when you don't take care of what I give you in the first place? So we're talking, remember, we're talking about taking root. 
We're talking about the reality of God, His bounty, His blessings being poured out into our hearts and lives. And we need to see it. If you can see it through this illustration, I believe it will change how you view your life. How you see yourself, if you will, in the mirror. And in reality, how God sees you in His mirror. Very important, you know. And so it poses the question, how does God see me in his mirror? Does he see me as a giver? Does he see me as a withholder? How does he see me? How he sees you is how you actually act yourself. Remember, it was them. They, they put their hands forward, right? And who did they see? Themselves. They withheld, and who did they see? Themselves. So you see, that's the essence about life itself, and it's about the essence about God producing the, the fruit that he wants to in our hearts and lives, and doing that. So we started talking about the reality about you and I that to take root. And we started talking about the, the measure of your treasure. We started talking about the other week about the treasures that God, because you made the choice in your life saying, God, I hear you talking. You want me to take root. You want me to produce fruit in my life because you're asking me to and because I love you, because I trust you, I'm going to give. Are you hearing me? And so in the midst of that, what happens is because you give of yourself, God gives back. See, that word take, of taking root, really is not so much of the taking as it is of the giving. And when you and I get to that place in our lives that our desire is what, Lord, you want, and that's what we choose to do even though we can't figure it out, and we, we trust God, and in the midst of that, when we do that, even though it seems like we're taking what God sees as the giving of ourselves. Are you hearing me this morning? And so when God sees that principle of reciprocity, the principle of the reflection in the mirror, happening on the inside of us, which literally takes place on the outside of us, because, listen, you'll never give it on the outside if nothing's happened in here. Hello, are you hearing me this morning? You'll never trust God with anything until you finally stop ignoring God and say yes, especially when it comes to giving to God. I mean, I can sit here and talk about finance all day, and that's not, my, that's not what my message is all about. But on that principle alone, if you can end up applying it into your life and realize that God's desiring you to give in your tithes and your offerings, not because he wants your money, because he doesn't, because he owns it already. And trust me, God can take it away from you any day. It's a fact. It's a fact. But if you learn to trust God and you do it because you're being obedient to God, then the, re the, the reality of learning how to take root becomes a dynamic in your life that changes your entire life in every area of your life. And that's when God can take that plant that he's planted and cause it to start to grow up to where it goes downward, but then it starts to produce fruit upward. And so that's what we've been talking about. And I know I'm running out of time. But listen, you've got to understand something in the midst of life itself. That in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, I briefly want to touch it. Three very quick points I want, to, I want you to understand this morning. That is part of this dynamic of that word take. We started talking about the treasures that God wants to benefit our hearts and lives with. And I'm here to tell you, you'll never receive God's treasures unless you're willing to give. Amen? But when you start to give, you start to discover that God has got eternal life for you. One of the greatest treasures that you'll ever have. His, his, his treasures are indescribable, they're indestructible, and you'll have them if you turn around and you give yourself to God, and you'll be, everything that God gives to you will endure forever when you choose to give unto God. But until that happens, nothing else will change in your life. But once it does, let me tell you something, get out of the way, because God is going to do something great in your heart and your life. You just got to let him do it, but you start with it. But in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, I'm going to just go through verse number 8 right now. 9, 10, 11, I'll briefly share with you in a moment. But listen, this is what Paul said. And this is a dynamic about the reality of you and I taking root. 
He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. What a reality of life itself when you understand that what God wants you to understand about your life today is that he wants you to have the same mind that Jesus has. That's the mind that you need to have today. That's what he's trying to develop in you. Because when he does, and the reality of that A for the take, and then the word take, literally what it boils down to is that when that happens in your heart and your life, literally the attributes of God start to reside on the inside of you, and you start to take on the attitude of God in the midst of everything that's going on in your life. Because all of a sudden your life is no longer about you, it's about what God wants to do in you. Because you see, that's what Jesus was. That's where he was. When Paul said, let the same mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, even though he was literally God himself, standing at the right hand of the Father, he did not have to give up anything, chose to give up everything, come down here, clothe himself in flesh, to be among you and I, so he could die on a cross, to give his heart and his life, so that you could have eternal life. Let me tell you something. God says, let that same mind be inside of you. That was inside of Christ Jesus. In other words, get out of the way. Start to Give unto God. Let God become the way. And when you sacrifice of yourself, God will start to pour out the bounty of himself. His attributes, his life, his, the reality of who he is will start to become alive inside of you. And then, oh, let me tell you something. You'll start to have a better attitude in life. In other words, your attitude won't be about you. It'll all be about reflecting him and everything that you do do. I know I'm out of time, but give me just two, a couple more minutes. Here's what it boils down to, briefly. If you don't mind, here's my thought for today. If you don't mind, it won't matter. In other words, if you don't take on the mind of Christ, anything you do in your life, it's not going to matter. If you don't turn around and start to get more like Christ within all you say and do, your life, it won't matter. Because that's what your life was designed for. Are you with me this morning? And when that happens, and when you turn around, that if you don't get the same mind that Jesus Christ has, if you don't take on the same attributes of the Lord, if you don't have the same attitude that the Lord has, your life won't matter. So what do you need to do? See, Romans 12, 2, it says this, And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, let me tell you something about your life, that when you turn around, take on the attitude and the attributes of God, and you allow God to transform your heart and life, something happens inside of you that changes everything in the midst of it. All of a sudden, God sees you because you have a heart towards God, and God starts to impart into you the very reality of not just His treasures, but his attitude and, and his attributes and then all of a sudden your life has changed and transformed from the inside out and when people look at you they don't see you anymore what they see is Jesus inside of you amen and when they see Jesus in you let me tell you something demons run demons take off and the power of God resumes and it resides in the midst of hearts and lives that choose to be God because the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God will reside on the inside of you and accomplish what God wants to accomplish on the outside of you. Oh, I'm here to tell you this morning, you've got to grasp a hold of the reality of God this morning and understand just these three things. Listen, when, when you turn around and you start to take on the attributes and the attitude of God in the midst of life, here's what happens to you. One of the attributes is this, the name that is above every name will dwell inside of you. I want you to understand that. In Philippians 2 and 9, it says, therefore God also has highly exalted him. Who? Jesus. And has given him the name, what? That is above every single name. Can I tell you this morning, when you got saved, Jesus came on the inside of you. And the very same attributes that Jesus holds, that the name is a name that is above every name. That same reality resides on the inside of you. And greater is he who is on the inside of you than the enemy who rules and reigns. I'm here to tell you today. Listen, to some of you may be struggling with things in your life. You may not know that you have victory. But I'm here to tell you, because Jesus... Jesus lives inside of you. You can speak to that demonic force and say, get thee behind me in the name of Jesus. And it must. It has no choice. Not because of you, but because of him who resides inside of you. Amen. That's part of the attributes and the power. 
and the attitude of God and what God wants to do in the side of our lives. Listen to Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. It's this. And it says, be renewed in the spirit of what? Of your mind. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Can I tell you this morning that when Jesus is living on the inside, when you start to take root in the reality of who you need to be in Christ himself, and he has liberty inside your heart and your life, all of a sudden when you start to take on the spirit in your mind of the reality of who Jesus Christ is, and you allow Jesus to live through you, I'm here to tell you, you become a new creation in Christ. Not only do you become a new creation in Christ, the power and the glory of God will live through you. Why? Because again, greater is he who resides on the inside of you than the enemy who lives in this world. I'm here to tell you, victory is yours. Second thing, real quick, is the power. You have the, literally the power to defeat the enemy. Why? Because that power to defeat the enemy dwells inside of you. It's there already. You just got to understand that Philippians 2.10 says that. And at, that, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every time, in heaven and on those on the earth and those under the earth. I'm here to tell you that everyone is going to bow before Jesus. What does that mean for you as a servant of the Lord who dwells on the inside of you? I'm here to tell you that means that the power of God is already alive inside of you. You just got to recognize it and know that you have victory over the enemy. Romans 8.11 says this. But if the Spirit of Him, the Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells inside of you, who, who He who raised Christ from the dead will also give, oh my gosh, He'll give you the power that you need in your mortal body to do whatever you need to have to do. I'm here to tell you that when the enemy starts lying to you, saying to you that you're no good and that God doesn't care about you, I'm here to tell you you need to look Him right in the eye. Say, Jesus Christ, who dwells on the inside of me, who raised Jesus from the dead, has given me the power. Satan, get thee behind me. You already have victory. You just don't know it yet. That's the reality of what's inside of you. Colossians 2, 9 through 11 says this. For in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of God, the Godhead bodily. You understand what that means for you? That inside of you, because Jesus dwells in you, is all the fullness of everything that God himself is. I don't understand it. I can't even begin to comprehend it. I'm not saying that makes me God. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying to you is that you need to recognize that even though the enemy comes against you, that because of Jesus that dwells on the inside, you can talk to that enemy. You can take him and put him over. And you can put him underneath your, underneath your foot. And in the midst of it, you have victory over him in every area of your life. Why? Because God himself self has given you that kind of victory in life. Amen. You just need to recognize it and walk in the midst of it. Amen. Listen, the last thing I want to say to you, because I know I'm a little rushed this morning, but it's all good. Listen, it gives you the ability to proclaim Jesus to all. That what dwells on the inside of you also. Why? Because you see in Philippians 2.11 it says this, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, he dwells inside of you. That empowers you to be able to have the same power that he's talking about. That every knee should bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means you have authority over everything that tries to stand in your way. All you've got to do is stand up and let God be God in the midst of what's going on inside of you. And in the midst of that, God himself will bring forth victory in the midst of everything that's going on. Listen, I'm here to tell you, that's just going back to Colossians 2, 9 through 11 for just a second that I just read. It says to him, for in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead. And you are what? Complete in him. You're complete in everything you are. Why? Not because of you, but because of him. So stop looking at yourself. Stop listening to the enemy. Stop listening to the lie that he tries to lie, lie to you, saying that you're not complete, you're not good, you're not this, you're not that. You are complete. Why? Because of Jesus who dwells inside of you. So the next time the enemy lies to you, tell him he's a liar. And know that you have victory over all these things because of Jesus who dwells on the inside of you. So what am I saying this morning? I'm trying to simply say a couple of things. And really it sort of boils down to this. That when you and I start to walk the way we need to, the fullness of 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15 starts to come to pass in our lives. You can go home and read it, but the essence of it, what it boils down to this, is that when you're committed to the Lord and you're sold out to him, that as in the midst of your life, you proclaim him, you allow him to do it. Everything that you do to his glory, one day it's going to come before the presence of God. 
And it's going to go through the fire of life itself. And what's going to come out of there are the things that were of value to the Lord that you did that represented and glorified Him. And when those things come out of that fire in the midst of it, when you and I stand before Him as His children, that in the midst of all the things that were there to glorify Him and they weren't for ourselves, those things when they come out of that fire, we're going to be able to take and lay them at His feet. We're going to be able to say that in the reality of life, Lord, you did this in and through me, but only to you be the glory. What does that mean? It simply means this. And here's what it means for your life. That if you don't mind, in other words, if you don't get your mind where it needs to be to be about the things that are concerned to God, the things that are important to God, the things that God desires for you and I to live and walk in. Why? Because he willingly paid the price for us. That if you don't mind the things that you need to mind, your life itself, it's not going to matter. Why? Because you chose not to matter about the things that are of matter to God. You see, when we do mind, when we have his mind, we take on his attributes and his attitude. And we're blessed by them. And in the midst of it, when we start to give to those things that God has called us to, the bounty of God fulfills everything that needs to be in my life. What I'm really saying to you is simply this. That if what concerns God doesn't concern me, how can I ever expect what concerns me to concern God? See, if you don't mind about what is on God's mind, in other words, if it doesn't concern you, if the things of God aren't of importance to you, why should you matter to Him? Now, you matter to Him. Don't get me wrong. Before you ever thought about Him, He was thinking about you. Before you ever gave anything to Him, He already gave everything to you. And He did it because he loves you. So how much more do you and I need to recognize that out of the greatness of the love that he's given to us, how we need to love him? See, if you do matter, if you do mind, your life will matter. But if you don't mind, it won't matter. So where are you today? We're talking about taking on the attributes of God. Having the same attitude that God has. In other words, letting our hearts and lives come to the place that we say, Lord, I need to allow you to cause me to take root. I need to be able to start my life so in a measure that, that I, I want to become not just the remnant of you, but I want you to live through me. I want to produce the fruit that you want. I want to do everything that you've called me to. And so in closing, here's my thought as we stand and get ready to close in prayer. You need to take a look at you. And you need to ask yourself a very simple question this morning. And most of us already know the answer. If you look at yourself and you feel you see yourself as being incomplete, you're trying to serve God, but you're stumbling, you're faltering, you're failing, I'm here to tell you you're far better off than you realize. You really are. Because you're not perfect. That's a, I know it's tough for some of you to understand, but take a look in the mirror this morning and discover but the point is simple. See, God accepts you in your imperfection. He does. But in that imperfection, He wants to perfect you. He wants you to end up looking just like Jesus. One person you and I all need to look like. And so He wants us to get that same mind in us that was in his son and allow him to change us and transform us but if you see in our lives if all that matters is me and all that I want and that's the only thing that does matter then guess what you really don't mind so really it won't matter where are you today where are you today Every head bowed and every eye closed.
If you realize that your relationship with the Lord is secure this morning, in other words, you know that you're saved, but nonetheless, you don't feel like you're where you need to be in your relationship with Him, I want you to just slip your hand up for me. Our hands being slipped up all over. All right, that's a great thing, you know. It's a great thing. You might be here this morning and you also realize that your walk with the Lord is one that you're struggling in. You know, you haven't arrived yet. But you do desire to arrive. In other words, you want to get closer to Him. Now, some of the same people may raise their hands, but there might be some of you that recognize that and you want to raise your hand. Would you raise your hand just for a second? See other hands going up. Now, I myself have not arrived yet. I know that. I'm still struggling. I'm still working at it. But I'm closer to today, today than I was yesterday. I know that. And the reason I know it is not because I go, hey, Jack, you're doing a good job. It's because I know of the struggle that's going on inside of me. And see, that struggle is, is that I want to have the same mind of Christ. And so if you desire to have a mind of Christ today, and you might have already raised your hand. You might want to raise it again. If you would desire to have the mind that Christ has today, I think... Seriously, if you're a Christian, I think every person's hand should be raised. Really. Because you see, that's what he wants us to have, is his mind. And then the last thing I'd ask is if you realize that you don't have the mind of Christ, you realize that the only thing that matters in your life is you, but you need to realize that he needs to become the very matter of your life. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I got hands being raised. I want you to grab a hold of the hands of those that are near you right now. You're beside you. You're holding the hand of the most precious person in the entire world to God. If you're watching online, I want you to do the same. Just sort of stretch your hand out here. And I want to pray a prayer with everybody. A prayer of great importance. A prayer that is a prayer that not only matters, but a prayer that can change everything so that it will matter. Father, you see our hearts and you see our lives today. You know our struggles. You know all the things that every one of us go through and the things that needs to be accomplished within us. You know our hearts better than we know our own. And so Lord, this morning, as I've raised my hand in so many different areas for so many different things. Lord, I'm asking that you would start to do with inside of me the work that needs to be done. For Lord, in raising my hand, I want to take root. In raising my hand, I want to surrender everything. In raising my hand, Lord, this morning, I want to take on your mind. So that my heart and my life, my mind will be changed and transformed. So that it will become conformed into your image. And that in your image, you can glorify yourself in and through me. For those of you that raised your hand knowing that you need to surrender. Right now, I'm just going to ask you to do a very simple thing. Just simply say, Lord, I surrender my heart and my life to you today. I want to take on your mind today. I surrender everything and I ask you to become Lord over my life today. And that in my surrender and in desiring to take on your mind, I'm asking, O oh Lord, today that you'll start to do a work inside of me so that I can start to take root and produce God fruit in my life. Father, we ask these things in the precious name of your Son. We ask these things so that in the midst of our asking, we have recognition inside of ourselves of our need of you. And Lord, in the midst of our asking, we surrender. And in our surrender, we ask, O oh God, that you do what needs to be done inside of our lives today in such a way that truly we will never, ever, be the same again. In Jesus' name I ask it. And the church said,
Amen. Give the Lord an offering of praise. Thanks for coming out and being with us this morning. Remember, if you don't mind, it won't matter.